This is just a short segment, but I hope you won't just let it blow by you, because there are a lot of wrong scientific papers in the literature written by people who didn't understand the point that we're going to make here. This is what I call the Poisson count pitfall. In the previous segment, we saw that Pearson's chi-square is a sum over bins of the number of counts in each bin minus the expected number of counts from a model and then we square that and then we want to divide by something which is like a variance but because the number of counts is Poisson distributed the variable is just the model value here and that's in the denominator so the notation has changed a little bit here from the previous segment but you can see that this is still a Pearson chi-square now the pitfall is that although it's called a chi-square its distribution is not actually chi-square distributed let's see how that comes about well, you can get a statistic that is accurately chi-square distributed in one of two ways. Either you can sum any number of terms that are individually accurately squares of normal t-values, because that's the definition of, of chi-square, or asymptotically you can get something that's asymptotically chi-square by summing a large number of terms, in other words if the number of bins here is very large, a large number of terms that individually have the same mean and variance as normal t-squared values. That works because of the central limit theorem. The actual t-squared values would go to a Gaussian and if your t-squared substitute values have the right mean and variance, then they'll go to the same Gaussian approximation. Well, let's think which, if either, of those things is true for Pearson's chi-square up here. Let's see, could this be an accurate square of a t-value? Not at all. X is drawn from a Poisson distribution, not a normal distribution, and if we take a Poisson variable and subtract a constant and, v and square it, that's nothing at all normal, it's just some messy thing. So that's not what we're trying to rely on here. What we're trying to rely on here is the fact that we have many bins and that therefore the central limit theorem will make this approximately chi-square. Well, that'll be true only if we get the right mean and variance. So let's start off by computing what is the mean and variance of each term that we want to get. We want to get the mean and variance of a chi-square distribution with one degree of freedom, because that's simply the square of a single t-value. And as we've seen before, that's distributed in this way. So I've written down an expression, which is, here it is written out a little bit, the probability distribution function of y, and y is the square of a t-value. And now to get the moments of that distribution, we simply multiply it by, I'm going to do three moments at a time here, either 1, y, or y squared, and then integrate it, here's the py, integrate it from 0 to infinity. So Mathematica can do that, and we see that the moments come out 1, 1, and 3. What's the interpretation of those numbers? Well, the first one here is the zeroth moment, and that coming out one just shows that I've typed in a properly normal distribution. Here. The second one is more interesting. That's the first moment, so that's the mean of the distribution, one. And to get the variance, or standard deviation squared of the distribution, we have to take the mean of the square minus the square of the mean, so that's the three here minus the one here, and the answer is two. We've actually seen these values, 1 and 2, previously when we discussed how the chi-square becomes approximated by a normal distribution. And you'll recall that chi-square with new degrees of freedom is approximately normal of mean nu, so that's just the sum of nu ones, and variance inside the square root, 2 nu, so that's the sum of nu values of 2 here. So as I say, if you're going to rely on the central limit theorem, you have to sum up a bunch of things that have the right mean and variance. And the Poisson distribution doesn't have that, and this is what people often get wrong. 
So let's go through a little calculation of that again in Mathematica. Here we have the Poisson distribution as a function of n and you see it's e to the minus mu the mean times mu to the n over n factorial so this is properly normalized and let's just check that that's right so let's compute the mean of the Poisson distribution here by asking Mathematica to sum from 0 to infinity Mathematica as we've remarked before can do some infinite sums and the first moment is going to be n times the Poisson distribution and sure enough Mathematica is able to do that sum and gives us the value mu let's do the next check let's check that we get the right variance so here we want to simplify the sum of n squared times the Poisson that's the second moment and then here in the same expression I'm going to subtract off the square of the mean and sure enough we get mu now let's calculate what we really care about let's see if this thing in here that we're pretending is a t squared variable in other words n minus mu squared divided by mu let's see whether that has the right mean and variance. So to find its mean under a Poisson distribution we multiply it by the Poisson distribution and we do the infinite sum and Mathematica is able to do that. I should have been clicking OK up here for this one, OK here for this one. We get the value 1 and that was in fact the mean of a true t-square value so that one is OK too. Okay, now the one that's not going to work out. Let's look at whether we get the right variance. So here's our t value squared, and we want its variance, so we square it, and then multiply by the Poisson distribution and do the sum. And again, because we want the variance, we want the expectation of the square minus the square of the expectation. So here's this t mean squared, which is what we computed right above here. And now you'll see that we don't get 2, which would be the right answer. We get 2 plus a correction term in 1 over mu. So if the expected number of counts in a single bin is very large, then this 1 over mu becomes negligible. But if you have data in which even some bins have small numbers of counts in them, then this 1 over mu may not be negligible at all. So the consequence of this is that Pearson's chi-square statistic, here it is again, does not go asymptotically to the expected normal distribution of mean nu, the number of degrees of freedom, and variance to nu, but rather it goes to one of mean nu and variance this to nu plus the sum of all of those 1 over mu terms, one for each bin. Now this can be insidious because you can see that the real distribution has a bigger variance than you might have thought if you acted naively. And that means that you could, if you don't understand this point, accidentally rule out perfectly good models because they would be within the variance that's allowed by this expression but if they were right at the edge not within the variance that's allowed say with some p-value for putting only a 2 nu here and that's why there are wrong papers published they're wrong papers which use the Pearson chi-square assuming that it does have the asymptotic normal chi-square distribution and use it to rule out a model which otherwise would not be ruled out by the data now you might be a little worried right away about this sum over i of mu i to the minus 1 because if you have some bins with very very small model expectations and that's very common because you could be way out on a tail where the model is predicting 10 to the minus 6 of a count or 10 to the minus 9 of a count well in that case this 1 over mu becomes a huge number and you then add that to the variance of your chi-square and essentially your chi-square test becomes worthless it's not that you'll get a wrong answer it's that you'll never rule anything out so what you have to do is before you apply the test you have to decide 
OK, if my model predicts less than, let's just say, one count per bin, I'm not going to try to measure agreement of the model with those bins. In other words, decide in advance which bins you're going to sum over and which bins you're not going to sum over, and you decide that from the model. You're not biased by the data when you do that. Then you see the data and you do the entire test just on the bins that have a model prediction greater than, in this example I'm saying, one count. It shouldn't matter much what that threshold is. If it does matter, then you have some other problem going on. Well, this is standard textbook stuff, but when I was preparing this lecture, I wondered whether modified Neiman, which we've talked about in the last segment, which people use instead of Pearson chi-square, whether that's any closer to the true chi-square. Maybe when I listed the three reasons that people often use modified Neiman, I should have listed a fourth re reason, which is that it doesn't have the Poisson count pitfall problem. So I computed that, and I'll show you the computation here. Here I just did it numerically in MATLAB. So what did I do? I decided to pick some fictitious bins that have different mean model predictions in them spanning a range from a tenth of a count per bin, half a count, one, 1 1.5, and so on, up to 30 counts per bin. So let's see what the discrepancies are, or I should say would be, for a bin that had those model values. Now I'm going to do these sums over the Poisson distribution numerically, and so I need an upper bound. I can't sum all the way to infinity. I'm going to sum 200 terms, which is more than enough when the mean only goes up to 30. And then you'll see what I'm doing here is I'm basically computing the t-value squareds, which is every possible observation between 0 and 200 minus the mean squared divided by mu. So here you see the Pearson chi-square formula. And then I'm also going to compute, I'm calling it TAS, the Neiman value. And so here you see the Neiman chi-square formula. Now I compute the means that I hope will be 1 for the Pearson and for the Neiman. And I compute the variances, which I hope will be 2 for both the Pearson and the Neiman. And then I print out what all those things are. What did I get when I did this? I got this table. So here in the first column, you can see I'm printing out mu, the means in each of these fictitious bins that I established up here. This column is what the mean of the Pearson t-squared value is, and we already derived analytically on the previous slide that that comes out 1, which is exactly right. The next column you can see down here is TA mean, so that's the mean of the modified Neiman. These should come out 1. Well, you can see they're quite different from 1 when the number of counts is small, and they only approach 1 asymptotically. As you can see pretty clearly, it's just 1 over the number of counts as the number of counts becomes large. So already even on the mean modified Neiman is even worse than Pearson. And then here is this variance problem where we discussed that Pearson does not go to 2, is not exactly 2 as it should be, but only goes to 2 asymptotically as the number of counts that get, get large. And here's the uh, Neiman value, and you'll see well, it's a little bit odd. It's not even monotonic, is it? It rises to a maximum of 6.4 when you have five counts per bin. Well, that's way off. And then falls again. And asymptotically, this will go to 2, but it's going to 2 even rather slower than the Pearson chi-squared. So I didn't, knew that, I didn't know this before preparing this lecture. Uh, Neiman is much worse than that. The verdict is don't use modified Neiman for a goodness, goodness of fit test unless the number of counts is way, way large. And if you use Pearson, be sure to include this asymptotic correction when you compute a p-value for the asymptotic normal distribution here. So that's the Poisson count pitfall and how to get around it.